All right, in this podcast, we're going to talk about Maxwell Boltzmann distributions um, and how they relate to ideal gases and real gases. All right, so by definition, a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution, um, which I'll commonly just refer to as a Boltzmann distribution, shows us the distribution of the speeds of all the gas molecules within a sample at a specific temperature. So you see how over here you have the number of particles, okay, on our y-axis, and then we have the energy of the particles down here. Okay, so all this under the curve represents the number of particles, okay, that are in the sample. And then this right here shows us where the activation energy is. That's the energy needed for um, the gases to actually have enough energy to react or to do anything. Okay, and so notice that this area behind it, that represents all the particles that don't have enough energy to react. And then after it, those are the ones that do. Okay, I would be remiss to um, not show you this particular simulation. Um, it's a gas simulation. And basically what it does is the different colors are telling up the different speeds of the particles. And then down here you see the distribution, the Boltzmann distribution. Um, it's very tiny. Sorry about that. But anyways, what I'm trying to get the point across too is that there's not very many with these extreme temperatures, the very, very hot white ones, or the very, very cold um, dark blue ones, but there are more that are in the larger area of the curve, okay? Now also, you can, um, you can change the energy and it will change the distribution. So you see as we heat it up, you see that the molecules on average are moving faster, and hopefully you'll see how it is causing the um, curve to broaden and flatten, right? All right, now thinking about that simulation, um, like I said, we have very few that have low energy and very few that have high energy, and most of the particles are in the large region of the curve like this. Okay, so temperature, like I was showing you on the simulation, is going to affect a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution by um, flattening out the curve. Okay, so you get a larger, your largest area, okay, is now going to be under a higher energy. Also notice over here, like the blue represents all of the molecules that have um, enough energy to react past the uh, activation energy here. And then the red section down here represents how many had that at the lower temperature. So basically, you see that as we um, increase the temperature, the curve flattens out so it's not as tall, and then it expands more towards the right. Here is a really, really good example with a bunch of them. So you can see we have 200K, and then 300, 500. So you see they're going more to the right, and then they're getting flatter and flatter, okay? So broader and broader and broader. All right, so what about if we had different sized gases and they were all at the same temperature? What does that do with the Boltzmann distribution? Okay, well, hopefully you're thinking, well, if they're all at the same temperature, the small ones have to be moving faster because they have a higher kinetic energy. And I would be like, yes, you're right. Okay, so the low molar mass when you see has the really broad one, and then intermediate, of course intermediate, and then the really, really large ones are going to be moving a lot slower on average. All right, so just to review, um, standard temperature and pressure, gas laws, and when we talk about gas laws, we're going to talk about ideal gases in just, uh, just a second, but everything is uh, revolves around uh, standard temperature and pressure. Okay, and then, which is one atmosphere and um, zero Celsius or 273 Kelvin, usually, okay? You can also have 760 millimeters mercury or 101.3 kilopascals, but understand these are all equivalent units no matter what. But basically, um, when we start to deviate from our STP, we start to see 
less and less ideal behavior. All right, so what is an ideal gas? First off, they're imaginary substances, um, but just the idea of them, the concept of them, helps us make predictions about what real gases do in our real world, okay? Um, so an ideal gas is assumed to have no volume compared with the volume of the space that is occupied by the gas. Uh, they do not interact, so they're not attracting or repelling um, any other molecules, so that means there's no IMFs at play. And they do not lose or gain energy during collisions with other gas molecules or even with the sides of the container. So we're assuming elastic collisions here. All right, now that we have talked about um, a little bit about general gases and ideal gases and their assumptions, let's talk about real gases because this is the real world, right? All right, so um, ideal gases, they obey our gas laws um, under all conditions of temperature and pressure. Well, we know that that is not real case, right? There's no ideal gas. Real gases, they obey the gas laws pretty much just like an ideal gas um, when they are at low pressures and high temperatures. So when they're moving very fast and they're very far away from each other, they are, we, their, their behavior is a lot more predictable, much more like an ideal gas. Um, remember that ideal gases, um, the volume is negligible as compared to the total volume occupied by the gas, whereas with real gases, that is not the case. Also remember that um, in an ideal gas, you have no force of attraction, and in a real gas, we know that we do have... Um, we have IMFs, right, in the real world. And then this is our equation that we use for ideal gases. This is an equation that allows for correction for volume and um, pressure. You will never have to use it, but there it is in case you were wondering. All right, so uh, real gases, they do not behave ideally when they are at low temperature and high pressure. Okay, so as a little picture over here, high temperature and low pressure molecules are moving very fast and they're very far apart. And so you see that it's hitting all of these tenants of an ideal gas much more easily. Whereas when you slow the molecules down with low temp and they're under high pressure, so they're being forced closer together, more collisions, you just have more chances of interactions occurring. And the volume is a much more significant deal because the size of the container's volume has been drastically changed. All right, so we have to correct volume for real gases because um, when we have an ideal gas, so we're under low pressure, if this were the gas molecule, okay, you see how much room it has. So it's not really this little bitty piece of spot that it's taken up. It's not a big deal. When you put it under a low volume, high pressure, then you see that there's much less room um, for the gas to move around, the volume is very much decreased, and you see that it's, well, it's a little bit more of a significant slice of that total volume, right? So that becomes an issue. All right, here's another uh, picture of it just at the molecular level. So see the molecules are all spread out. Here, force closer together, pressure is increased, they're colliding more. Um, so you're going to have more interactions occurring, and their volumes become a bigger deal. All right, so condensation is going from um, a gas to a liquid. So if you think about it, if you decrease the temperature of molecules, then they're going to slow down. They're going to get closer together. When they slow down and they get closer together, then you're allowing the um, IMFs to take back over, right? So that becomes an issue. Um, also, if they're at high pressures, they're colliding a lot more. They're being forced closer together. So again, they're gonna, their IMFs are going to start to become more of an issue because the molecules are now close enough to where the, uh, the forces can begin to take over again. 